The world has entered a new arms race at a time of relative peace. Spending $1.5 trillion, $217 for every person on the planet, as Washington doubles its military budget, and many regional and international powers join the race. We ask, what justifies this global military addiction? This is Empire. Hello and welcome to Empire. Has the world gone mad? Otherwise, what explains a new arms race at a time of relative global peace? The 50% increase in military expenditures over the last decade demonstrates how the post-Cold War peace dividend evaporated in favor of corporate war dividend. Some claim it's more of the same nationalism-driven, geopolitically motivated militarization. Others point to the absurdity of investing in more of the same military hard power at the expense of badly needed civilian investments when strategic use of force proves limited in the hotspots of the Middle East and useless in the gray areas of globalization. The answers are anything but simple, but certain figures speak louder than images. Take these two leaders. One is the leader of an aggressive and militaristic country with ambitions that threaten world security. And the other is Kim Jong-il, North Korean dictator and the world's favorite bogeyman. For only one of them is responsible for the biggest, most unnecessary global military spending spree the world has ever seen. How's it going, Bagram? What you actually have had is a huge increase in expenditure on the military when objectively the world is actually more peaceful than it was. This year, as the world struggles through its economic crisis, it will spend more than 1,500 billion on weapons and the militaries that wield them, the equivalent of $217 for every person on the planet. In many countries, military budgets are increasing at a time of austerity. We'll cut everything else, social security even, but not the military budget. The world has known three catastrophic arms races in the past century. First, led to the carnage of World War I. Second, fueled the fires of World War II. Do you deny that the USSR has placed missiles and sites in Cuba? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no. <laughs> and the Cold World rivalry between the Soviet Union and America took the planet to the edge of a nuclear abyss. The arms race of the Cold War was very much about competing ideologies and empires, very much east-west. And about 85% of all world military spending in the 1970s and 80s was spent by NATO and the Warsaw Pact. So it was very clear-cut, um, states or alliances versus each other. Now it is very different. With the Soviet Union long gone, who are America's enemies today? According to Washington, North Korea and Iran are the two most dangerous states on the planet. Allahu Akbar. Yet neither is even on the top 15 highest spenders on their militaries, and even allowing for the highest cost manufacturing in the West, the US outspends the rest of the world on a dramatic scale. The league table of top arms spenders shows Western nations and countries allied to the United States occupying 12 of the top 15 spots. Between them, America and its allies are responsible for more than 70% of all military spending. Only China and Russia break up the dominance of this pro-American alliance. We'll reform our defense budget so that we're not paying for Cold War era weapon systems we don't use. But whatever he says, President Obama is increasing America's defense spending, not cutting it. The country he leads now spends 53 cents of every tax dollar on its military, more than it did during the height of World War II. The United States runs on threats. We have enemies out there, many of them imagined, some of them real, but even the real ones are magnified in our imagination. 
And if you thought the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were driving U.S. military spending alone, think again. Of the $708 billion military budget for the coming year, just $159 billion is earmarked for special spending on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And remember this, Presidents Obama and Medvedev pledging to slash their arsenals of nuclear weapons. The United States and Russia have agreed to the most comprehensive arms control agreement in nearly two decades. Odd then that just a month later, President Obama asked Congress for an additional $7 billion to spend on upgrading America's nuclear weapons in 2011, a 10% increase on this year's budget. We've done no real change in our thinking. It's almost like the momentum of the Cold War 20 years later has not gone away. And America's military deals with its allies ensure that the U.S. is also the world's biggest trader in the global arms bazaar. In 2008, it sold $37.8 billion of weapons, two-thirds of all international arms deals. But if the actual threat of global war has diminished, what is driving America's willingness to fuel the global arms race? Joining me to discuss the global military buildup is Robert Kaplan, national correspondent for the Atlantic Monthly, senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, and author of, among others, Monsoon, The Indian Ocean and the Future of American Power. Ellen Leibson, president and CEO of the Stimson Center, which is committed to global peace and security, and formerly the vice chair of the National Intelligence Council from 1997 to 2002. Joseph Sirianzioni, president of Plowshares Fund, a foundation focused on nuclear weapons policy and conflict resolution, author of, among others, Bomb Scare, the History of Future of Nuclear Weapons, and former director for nonproliferation at the Carnegie Endowment. And last but not least, Ambassador Richard Butler, Distinguished Scholar of International Peace and Security at Penn State University, former Executive Chairman of the United Nations Special Commission to Disarm Iraq, and author of The Greatest Threat, Iraq, Weapons of Mass Disruption, and the Crisis of Global Security. Gentlemen, Ellen, welcome to Empire. Ellen, let's start with you. Is there an arms race out there, and what's America's role in it? Well, I think the United States certainly believes that our allies around the world and our security partners have to do their part to modernize their own inventories and to prepare for the challenges of the day. I think there's a lot of big questions about whether the weapon systems are well suited to the current threats. And you I think, think they are well suited? Well, I think it's worth considering how much has the sort of arms industry adapted to a world where some of the threats are actually non-conventional, such as terrorism, climate change, et cetera. So I hope we can think a little bit about whether this pattern of arms sales is, uh, relates logically and efficiently to uh, what I believe is really a changing threat environment over the last decade. So my guess is there's a bit of a mismatch there. It, mm -hmm. Joe, does it make sense to you that 20 years after the Cold War, the United States, for example, is spending something like double what it spent during the 1980s? No, it doesn't make any sense at all. And what we've seen since 2001 is a doubling of the U.S. defense budget. So just in nine years, we've gone to a budget that's over $700 billion a year. During that same time, we've seen this doubling of the international arms trade. So both of these, to me, are part of this over-militarized response to the terrorist threat that manifested itself on, on on, on September 11th. And as Ellen points out, a lot of these weapons have nothing to do with the terrorist threat. You don't need jet fighters to go after uh, Al-Qaeda al operatives. You don't need tanks to deal with uh, insurgency operations in countries. A lot of this, to me, is fueled by uh, a clinging to the Cold War patterns. The same weapons that were in the pipeline during the Cold War are now coming out of the pipeline and being sold around the world. So what do you think, uh, Robert? I mean, they're, they're basically renewing more of the same old weaponry. Is there a strategic imperative that justifies that? Yes, there is a lot of legacy systems that we keep building and spending money on that we don't need. Another thing that's driving this 
is that the U.S. is the principal power in the Western Hemisphere, seeks to preserve the balance of power in the, e in the Eastern Hemisphere. Because so it's no also the dominant power there right, or not? Uh, no, it's not the dominant power. What it seeks to do is preserve a balance so that one, no one nation in Eurasia becomes, you know, becomes overly dominant to threaten U.S. interests. And, you know, someone can argue that whereas the U.S. Navy had 600 warships in, um, you know, at the end of the Cold War or near the end of the Cold War, it's now down to 286 and may go down to 250. Well, so if the Navy's getting so much smaller, why is it costing more and more money? Because of all the weapon systems that they're putting on each ship. It now costs about $5 billion or something to build a destroyer or about $10 billion for an aircraft carrier. The whole procurement process is you want every new high-tech gadget on every warship. Could I make another point, yeah. Marwan? It does seem to me worth saying that during the Cold War, we didn't really use all the weapons we had. We never fought with the, with the Soviets. For the last 10 years, we've been continuously at war. So we've also used up. Uh, so some of the logic of the defense budget now is that the military system has to replace some of the equipment that's been worn out by the very long deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. Richard, let me toss, forgive this word, a hand grenade onto the table. The statistics that you put forward demonstrate all of the characteristics, the hallmarks of a profound addiction, mm. right? We are addicted, it would appear, to buying weapons. We've got to go back to the basic logic involved here. First of all, all people have a right to feel secure. All states under the Charter of the United Nations have a right to self-defense. And if you're going to seek those goals, of course, you will need some weapons. The question is what kind, how many, and at what cost, and this is why I use the term addiction. Any logical answer to those questions, self-defense, how much, for what purpose, and what do we need, in the face of these statistics show that we are addicted to the idea that you can solve your problems by buying more and bigger guns but, and but it's it's nuts but it's nonsense but it has to stop as robert says there is a, there is a, a logic uh, there's a rationale out there that in order to maintain american leadership and to deter any other rising powers from competing with america that america needs to spend so much money but there is a way to spend it and how do you spend it this is what secretary gates is addressing right now that he knows we're headed for a time when there are going to be severe cuts in defense spending because of um, the american economy and all that and uh, so he's like preparing the military to the defense establishment to become more efficient um, yeah, because you know we could talk for hours about wastage and weapons programs yeah, but, you, but you just switched <coughs> from the logic of national security, which I insist, and I'm sure we all agree, everyone has a right to pursue, to the notion of American leadership. Exactly. Or dominance. Or dominance. That's right. And I do question <coughs> this notion of American leadership. I'd rather talk about common security, defined in modern terms. Otherwise, Joe, some claim that, in fact, as it pursues uh, its, its leadership or, or preserving its leadership, America is going through a phase of decline, primarily because of its military budgets. There's no question that the increased cost of the military budget has contributed to the huge American budget deficit. So we fought two wars that we didn't pay for. We just put the money out and we borrowed the money basically mm -hmm. from China to finance a Absolutely. trillion dollars in military expenditures in I Iraq and Afghanistan. This is part of the decline, but at the same time, it's impossible for the United States to admit that that military spending is part of our mm -hmm. decline. It's politically very difficult for, for the U.S. military to do that. And then on the relations part. It's true that one tool of a great power in building alliance systems around the world is arms sales, is arms trade. You want your partners, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, to buy the weapons that you yourself have to have interoperability, to develop close relations. What happens in there is once you start that channel going, the people who make the weapons, the defense contractors, start reaming out that pipeline, puffing it up, and the, the dollars just start flowing. And suddenly what should be a modest, reasonable arms business, arms trade, security alliance, becomes a tens of billions of dollars that both bankrupts the, the taxes 
the, uh, the, the countries receiving the, the arms and inflates the role of military in the country supplying yeah, I think what we need to put on the table as well is that in our logic is the question of whether this ever increasing expenditure on arms makes war and conflict more mm -hmm. rather than less likely. Yeah. America, I think, is in decline. It's in what I call elegant decline. You know, mm -hmm. um, Soft landing, you mean? Yeah, hopefully, mm -hmm. because I think America's goal should be to basically prepare the way to put itself out of business as the dominant power in the world, to encourage like-minded others to build up mm -hmm. uh, their militaries, their economies, their leadership skills, to become, as we keep pleading with the Chinese, to be responsible stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But in Asia, it's a different story. We're going to uh, talk about uh, Asia. All right. Hold yeah. on to this yeah. thought. Yeah. We prepared a background uh, yeah. report, okay. if you will on Asian security right. and the rise of China as the new yeah. competitor of the United States. Let's watch. In Northeast Asia, five of the world's biggest military spending nations face each other across the South China Sea. Between them, the United States, China, Russia, South Korea and Japan account for 65% of all global military spending. And that's getting bigger year by year. The Asian seas are a potential flashpoint major powers like Japan, South Korea, and China have been investing a great deal in naval power. Over the past decade, China has increased its military spending by between 10 and 20 percent every year. It now has the second biggest military budget in the world. For the first time in centuries, China has both a strategic imperative to develop its maritime capabilities and maritime area defenses and also the ability to do so. Beijing has long argued that it's simply playing catch up. If we increase the military expenditure at a common speed, our military forces will always fall behind others and cannot fulfill their mission of defending the country. But Washington has interpreted this as a serious bid for dominance in the region. Some in America think that there is something to fear in a rising China not least because Beijing is spending heavily to build a navy with blue water capacity that would allow it to rule these waves. There is a broader Chinese goal of uh, creating the conditions under which all actors in the region will feel obliged to think, what will Beijing think of this? What would Beijing, how would Beijing react to this? To counter the perceived threat of China rising, all its regional rivals are now locked into spiraling naval spending. South Koreans say, well, we're building this, these uh, ships, these large ships that are very similar to Japanese ships because the Japanese have a bunch of them. The Japanese say, well, we're building all these capabilities because look at the Chinese, they're building a bunch of them. But the most dangerous aspect of this new arms race is happening far below the public radar. The seas of Northeast Asia are patrolled by rapidly increasing submarine forces from at least 10 countries. Many of them still struggling with the poisoned legacy of past wars. There is only one China. Taiwan is part of China. And some of the most potentially explosive unresolved disputes on the planet. Bad historical memories and territorial disputes, if you combine all of those factors, you have a, a, a perfect sort of um, perfect storm brewing here in terms of a potential regional uh, crisis or confrontation in the future. The row between North and South Korea over the torpedo attack on one of South Korea's ships inexorably dragged its superpower sponsor into the dispute. We are um, viewing this as an unnecessary response while Japan's interception of a Chinese fishing boat in the disputed waters of the South China Sea, we will defend our sovereignty. There should be no changes in our stance in that in the future. Has brought simmering regional tensions to the boil. It was Japan who provoked the matter. Japan has repeatedly made mistakes, aggravating the situation. The submarines and warships flood the shipping lanes of these most volatile waters. How long before a minor clash between regional rivals turns into a major international crisis? And if it does, 
who will stop a full-blown shooting war? Southeast Asia and even Northeast Asia, uh, they do not have any regional mechanisms for crisis management. And that means that it's going to be a matter of picking up the phone and calling whoever and hoping that someone picks up. Robert, here you have it. Excessive American search for security is leading for Chinese insecurity and hence fueling the arms race in Asia. For the last 60 years or so, the Western Pacific and the greater Indian Ocean have been in effect American lakes, uh, patrolled and dominated by the U.S. Navy. Just as we entered a multipolar economic world a few decades ago, we're starting to enter a multipolar military world as well. It's not just the growth of the Chinese military, it's also the fact that Japan has four times as many warships as the British Royal Navy and is, you know, even with just one percent of its GDP is rapidly modernizing in niche capabilities. South Korea is rapidly modernizing its military. Uh, Southeast Asia is spending uh, you know, 30 percent more on its budgets, defense budgets, than 30 years ago. We're seeing the rise of indigenous military powers combined with the shrinkage of space on the map caused by uh, military technology, and we get overlapping ballistic missile ranges going all the way from the Mediterranean to the Sea of Japan. That is so saturating, it's actually giving me a headache. Ellen, I don't know about you, but this whole talk about asymmetrical means and investment in new ways of dealing with new threats in the age of globalization, we're leaning back on same old conventional weapons. I think that the cycle of the Cold War that led to, in theory, greater peace and prosperity in Europe, less requirement for defense. The Asian half of the story is a very different trajectory, and we are seeing kind of the reemergence of traditional rivalries, uh, nationalism, uh, geopolitics. Uh, Richard, tell me, how much is that uh, generated, fueled by nationalism, and how much is it that a rising power like China doesn't want to see a repetition of the U.S. dominance, for example, in the, in the Persian Gulf, or dominance in the blue open waters where a lot of the trade lanes now are basically under American watch? Does this make security more achievable, or does it make the possibility of conflict far larger. I put it to you seriously. Is that a rhetorical that question or you have an that answer? No, for that? That I put it to you seriously that the latter is the answer. If they continue to do this, they will not increase their security, but they will make serious conflict more and more likely. Now, now I don't think we have an urgent situation here militarily. I think the dominant uh, factor in the region is the rise of China economically. That's the influence you feel. I just came back from two weeks in Australia and New Zealand, and China's now their major tra trading partner. Mm. And they say this is the first time in their history that their major strategic partner has not been their major trading partner. Not the mm. British, not the Americans, Good it's point. the Chinese. Mm. So they automatically think about any issue first what do the Chinese think about this? Right. Not because of their warships, because of the trade relationships. But as this trend increases and as we fuel it, the United States is encouraging Japan to build up its military, encouraging Japan to, 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 to the unease of some of its neighbors to start doing military exercises mm -hmm. and participate in military operations far from its shores. As we sell arms to India, as we're doing, well, what happens? Other countries will match that. So now we see China moving from the small arms trade, where they sell rifles and machine guns and, and the like to A Asian and African countries, starting to sell fighter jets, the J-17, to Pakistan, yeah. mm -hmm. their ally, mm -hmm. which of course India will use as a justification for greater arms sales. And you see how this can go, how it just ratchets right. up oh, until sure. you get to a, an, may perhaps an un unintended crisis that could trigger a larger war. <laughs> The Indian Ocean is the world's energy interstate. Right. The Chinese want ultimately to be able to protect their own sea lanes. Hu Jintao has reportedly, you know, spoken about China's Malacca dilemma. Mm -hmm. They're looking for other ways to get energy and goods mm -hmm. into China from the Middle East without using the Strait of Malacca. Also, the Chinese look at the South China Sea the way the United States used to look at the Caribbean. Uh, the Caribbean was an international it's waterway. But the U.S., since John Quincy Adams, always made it clear to the Europeans that it may technically be international, but we dominate it. Mm -hmm. And we and the Chinese and Chinese officials have said this to me: Why should we think any differently about the South China right. Sea than you Americans think about the Caribbean? The fundamental motivation here is protection of economic interests, and yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. My point is that the way to do that effectively 
is not yeah. necessarily through military expansion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. B and the problem with military expansion is that it causes the other guy to become anxious and then you get an arms race and that makes conflict more likely. The way you're putting uh, the, our dilemma is in the sense that more military spending will lead to more security for an insecure China, for example, or for an insecure United States before 9-11. But is there an economic dimension to it? We're going to discuss that right after the break. Welcome back. Behind each and every military buildup, there is a gun and butter debate. Here in Washington, many believe that the country's military spending after World I and II aside from its obvious military goals, pulled the U.S. out of recession and propelled it into unprecedented growth in the 1950s. Others see its military spending during the Cold War as a drain on its economy and argue that its excessive militarization is leading to its eventual decline. Meanwhile, the vast network of corporate interests across the country is de facto tipping the balance in favor of more arms spending. This is the map of the United States. And this is the map of the weapons industry in the U.S. Almost each one of the 50 states hosts some component of the military arsenal. Large defense companies are spread across the United States, sometimes strategically. It's the strategy of what's been called the military-industrial complex, or even the military-industrial-congressional complex. The same huge machinery of power that President Eisenhower started seeing as a threat back in 1961. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. This is the strategy of power. Weapon manufacturing giants like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, or General Electric spread their plants across as many states as possible. More states means more seats in Congress to defend their interests. More seats in Congress means more money in the defense budget and multi-million contracts won by the weapons firms, which means more jobs for that district, which equals more votes to that congressman who assigned those contracts to be re-elected. So the trade is more money in weapons in exchange for more votes, or what's known as pork barrel politics. Pork barrel politics have a long history in the United States. Pork actually used to be kept in barrels. That would be a source of food for your family. And so it gets at this idea of politicians bringing something that the people who voted for them need. Um, it's a little bit crass, but just refers to the addition of, I guess, fatty deposits in the budget. What they're talking about is spending on particular weapon systems that don't contribute to national security but are pushed because they benefit members of a certain state or district. Take the C-17, a large cargo plane built by Boeing that Congress keeps adding to the defense budget, even though the Pentagon says they have... Plenty of. We have 250 of them. They don't need any more. But every year, Congress adds from 5 to 10 more C-17s because the program is spread across 44 states. It has very, very many congressional interests. The defense budget even still covered for obsolete big dinosaurs of the Cold War era, like the F-22 Raptor that was only recently killed. Many people said, why do we need this? Well, the manufacturer, Lockheed, moved the plant to make it to Georgia, where you had the Speaker of the House was from Georgia, the Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee was from Georgia, and so the United States spent something like $65 billion to buy these planes to deal with a threat that doesn't exist anymore. But now they're all fighting for another big piece of pork, the F-35, a sophisticated fighter jet built by Lockheed Martin, which Congress is so happy with that some want to build a second engine for it. The Pentagon doesn't want it, but members of Congress do because it's going to create more jobs in states like Ohio, Virginia, and Massachusetts. It's very hard to vote against hundreds of jobs, even if you're voting for a program that you don't need. So, are we talking about defending the country or defending jobs in a recession? Well, if you're looking at government spending as a way to stimulate the economy, defense is the least effective way to do it. 
And so it has come to pass. Defense budgets have kept growing, inflated with fat, every year since 9-11. But in an age of austerity, something's got to give. We simply cannot continue to spend as if deficits don't have consequences, as if waste doesn't matter. But can a president ever win this old battle, which so many before have lost? Ellen, we spent half, the first half of the show discussing the strategic rationale. But isn't it the case of the military companies, corporations are just too big to fail? Well, I think we have a dilemma here because, of course, in a more perfect world, we'd switch these economic activities to things that benefit the society on the civilian side more directly. But the president himself has said that economic prosperity is part of our national security strategy. So it, you can't flip the switch very quickly from one kind of industrial activity to another. Most of these big but 20 years, Ellen. Well, but most of these big companies say they want to do homeland security, they want to do green technology, but the truth is there's a lag factor, there's an inertia factor, and they don't they they also worry that the the defense budget has been this sweet uh, experience for them and that some of these other if they were to civilianize a lot of their product line and and look to other parts of the federal system for their procurement strategies uh, the money will not be as high, you know the, the the levels just won't be as high Joe you're the head of plowshares mm -hmm. so are we, what are we saying here uh, swords into plowshares or plowshares into <laughs> swords is this good for the economy You'd have to have some amount of defense spending, but clearly it's gotten out of control. I spent 10 years on Capitol Hill working on the Armed Services Committee, working on defense budgets. Let me tell you, never underestimate the power of money to shape U.S. security policy. Let me give you just one example that I'm dealing with. The president, as you pointed out, has said he wants to cut U.S. nuclear weapons. Some of those weapons are long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. We have 450 of those in five bases in the United States. When the president was reviewing the nuclear posture of the United States, there were rumors that he was going to cut some of those ICBMs. The senators representing those five states all joined together in an ICBM caucus and lobby an ICBM caucus and lobby the president don't cut any of our missiles. They represent jobs in our district. Now, we're only talking about dozens of jobs here, not a lot, but that was enough to sway these senators. Five states, two senators apiece, that's 10 Senate votes. That's a force that the president has to listen to. The way to deal with this, be transparent, be honest about it. Explain to people that this is going on so they can see the role that jobs and contracts have in your defense decisions. So, Robert, is this a question of saving jobs or is it a question of saving corporate profit. This Joe is democracy at work. Is it democracy at work? In our crazy system. system. Or is it yeah. buying influence? It, 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 in our crazy system, um, capitalism and democracy equals buying influence in many ways. There's another point here. No, but isn't this against democracy? For the four major armed contractors to be able to spend $500 million over 10 years in lobbying yeah. Congress. Wouldn't you say I those agree. companies have I more agree. democracy than you and me have? Yeah. I, I agree. I'd like to make another point, though, which is that the problem is you, the Pentagon does not have the luxury to plan for one future. It has to plan for several futures. Um, every war is often very different than the war previously. The first Gulf War gave us no indication of what the second Gulf War would be like. Uh, the war in Vietnam harkened back not to World War I or II, but back to the Philippine War at the turn of the 20th century. So they've got to diversify their weapon systems. Now, I believe that we're not likely to fight a big land war in the future. I think any instability in Co North Korea, for example, is more likely to lead to the mother of all humanity interventions than it is to any tank battles and things like How that. How about blue water um, conflict? Well, a blue water conflict... It, it, There's no more Soviet Union. Um, but there is a rising China. And also, with, remember, navies are used not just to fight wars. They're used for peaceful purposes in ways that other branches of the armed services are not. Um, you know, navies make port visits. They protect commerce, the sea lanes. Uh, you know, they, you know the, what allows globalization to proceed is the safety, of the relative safety of the sea lanes where piracy is more of a nuisance than a real strategic threat. Well, Richard, uh, Roberts is still insisting on the strategic dimension <laughs> of this. Is this what you just saw earlier? Is this a question of more strategic 
strategic necessity or is it corporate necessity? Oh, this is all about money and the weird and wondrous workings of democracy. There was President Eisenhower, mm. okay? Hardly a left-wing pinko, beads and sandals, smoking marijuana. He was a five-star general, a Republican, a president. And there he was, 60 years ago, telling us the truth, that the military-industrial complex will drive us to a disaster. He was right then, he's even more right today. This is nuts. U.S. military budget may be on the brink of making another uh, bout of, over, of directionless overspending because the new craze is cyber warfare. Right, right. And, yeah. and you can go and, you know, and. You can spend an infinite amount of money exactly. on that. Exactly. Yes. And if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to waste money in untargeted ways towards cyber warfare in the same way we wasted money in untargeted ways in, in mm. post 9 11. Well, there's well, the other, I didn't know there's, the, a, there's yeah. a cyber general. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other inefficiency is that, you know, we learned the lessons from the last war, so we think we have to restructure ourselves as if we're always going to fight the last war, yeah. and we never do. Yeah, nobody's well, talking about disarming, about not spending money on defense. No. And getting the balance right between need. military yeah. and civilian. On cyber, for example, the big, the, 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 the big turf war is between the Department of Homeland Security versus defense. And defense says, we know how to do this. We've got all these technical systems. Just rely on us. Mm -hmm. And we're mm -hmm. underutilizing the civilian side of our own system. What's happening is although there's a, a, there's a supply side for all this that we were discussing, there's now a new, even more absurd demand side to it. Lots of countries just want to buy these new sophisticated weapons, mm. especially in the Middle East. Another U.S. arms deal with Saudi Arabia is in the pipeline, the biggest in history. This $67 billion deal includes 84 new F-15s, 70 Apache helicopters, 72 Black Hawks, 36 Little Birds, and $30 billion for the Navy. This deal alone surpasses the entire global arms sales in 2009, already $57 billion. And it's not just Saudi Arabia. Other countries in the region are also embarking on one of the largest rearmament exercises in peacetime, all fueled by petrodollars. The UAE will get $36 billion worth of arms from the US, Oman $12 billion, and Kuwait seven and it's not just the gulf or america arms sales to north africa increased by 62 percent in the last four years russia too has signed substantial arms deals with oil-rich libya and algeria which is increasing its defense budget by more than 10 percent to 5.4 billion dollars and last and very much not least a new 4.2 billion dollar deal We'll see Iraq getting 18 F-16 jets and a range of high-tech equipment from the US. So what's behind this arms build-up? Is it Tehran's real or perceived military program? And its continuing tensions with the United States and Israel? And then there's Israel itself. The only nuclear kid on the block and already the preeminent regional military power, not shy about using its power ratcheting up the need for more foreign arms. In addition to existing US military aid, agreements worth over $30 billion. A new $3 billion deal will give Israel 20 new F-35s. You could potentially see a nuclear arms race throughout the Middle East. Some justify these deals as merely replacing obsolete weapon systems. Others would call it an insane arms race, where winners could end up as losers. The domino theory was once about spreading freedom and democracy in the Middle East, but is it spreading weapons instead? Uh, Richard, do you think the invasion of Iraq has, has been the cause for the new arms race in the Middle East? I don't know, because going back to the inner point, uh, the basic point of an inner logic, w what is it for? What are these weapons for? Who do these people proposed to fight with sixty billion dollars worth of weapons I have no idea why they're doing this why they're using their people's money in this way is there a question of dependency we used to say in the 70s Joe that dependency meant you sell your cheap natural resources and you get expensive products now you sell oil and what do you get in in, in instead 
useless, expensive planes? Yeah. Well, there is an underlying, you know, strategic logic, strategic threat in the region, fueled by, I would say, the the continuing conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, the unresolved Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and suspicions about Iran's intentions, particularly its nuclear program. That is then answered uh, currently by a U.S. extending its alliance structures into closer and closer relations with countries basically allied against Iran, and, and countries like Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates see the need to beef up. That then gets carried to an extreme, I would say, for, t for, for three reasons. One, the contractor's pushing the product. You may have an addiction, but you need that pusher there, right. you know, selling you, look, but this is really good stuff, buy this. Two, kickbacks. The country pays for the product, but mm -hmm. officials make a lot of money on who they decide to be the contractor. And three, prestige. They all want it. They all want the best and the brightest. So they're getting F-16s and F-15s now. Right next wave, they want the F-35 and the F-22s top of the line to show that they are, 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 are real players, not just in the region, but in the world. What's going on is fear of Iran. Why is Iran impulsively looking to develop a nuclear capability? I would argue that Iran has learned a lesson the same that the North Korean leaders have learned, that had Saddam Hussein actually had a nuclear weapon in 2003, he would still be alive today, his sons would still be alive today, and his family regime would still be in power. So uh, Iran because the calculations of even the Bush, Rumsfeld, Cheney team would have been different. So there's this need to have a weapon as, as a regime security issue. Uh, now, having a nuclear uh, capability is, is agreed upon across the board in Iran, even among those who are opposed to the regime. But a regime with a, with a capability right. um, is one that is le less likely, perhaps, to be overthrown. And, 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 and then here's, yeah. the, here's, the, here's the dynamic that you see. So Iran, let's say, is doing this for defensive purposes. This is the weapon or capability that can protect it from a U.S. regime change attack. Its neighbors see this as a valuable tool that Iran would use to impose hegemony on the region, and they want to resist that. When but, Joe uh, talked about the three conflicts in the region, I would say it's 80 to 90 percent the Iranian threat. I don't think that these weapon sales have any relevance to the Arab-Israeli peace process. But you had earlier asked us about almost an implicit bargain between economic interest and security interest. And I think that's always been part of the story, that to the extent that the West is dependent on the export of oil from the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, in exchange, they purchase things from mm -hmm. us to buy kind of a political and security protection. That's exactly and right. And Marwan, now that Iran and its program has been put on this table, and it, and it should have been, I'd like to say this about it. Iran is a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and there's every reason to believe that it is actively seeking to break its obligation never to have a nuclear weapon. That's wrong and massively destabilizing and of course it leads others to want to acquire weapons to defend themselves against that. But there can be no serious discussion of Iran's nuclear program without referring to the fact that another country in the region, Israel, has nuclear weapons. It never confirms that it has, but everyone knows it does. Joe, you're an expert on the nuclear question. You actually made the claim that uh, the arms race in the 50s and the 60s followed, in the 70s and so on, followed Israel's nuclear program. Do you think Iran's nuclear program today is what is fueling? And as Robert say, would have Iran done anything else after the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq? Well, the really interesting dynamic is that Israel's nuclear program did not precipitate other countries acquiring nuclear weapons. They, they armed themselves, they developed other measures, but no one started a nuclear program because of Israel's program. It wasn't seen as that kind mm -hmm. of a threat. But when a rival state, a real rival state, Iran, starts to acquire that nuclear program, well, then you get blowback from the, the Sunni Arab Turkish exactly. neighbors yeah, that do exactly. not want exactly. the domination. What do you mean? You mean Israel Turkey is not a real rival, but Iran is? It, not in yeah. the same way no. that right. Egypt, Joe's Turkey, right. Saudi Arabia, and Iran jockey right. for power. One of those states or combination yeah. is going to be the hegemon in the region. Iran yeah. is making a bid and it's getting pushed back. So you've seen this. We've been talking about the conventional arms race. There is also a nascent nuclear arms race now in the region. Since 2007, mm -hmm. a dozen Middle East states have started civilian nuclear 
nuclear programs. This is about countering Iran. Persia has been a regional superpower since antiquity. Yeah. Persia fronts on the two oil-rich region, regions of the Middle East, the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf, both. The Iranian plateau dominates the region. So it's, you know, it's a great, you know, for in geopolitical terms, it's a great mid regional power in the yeah. way that Israel is not. If Iran is the new bogeyman in the region, is it not then, once again, as a result of the invasion of Iraq, weakening Iraq, the rise of Iran? Yeah. No, and it's really important. Iraq is, an, and, and the invasion of Iraq is, is obviously a major yes. event that's happened yes. in, in the recent period. But the invasion of Iraq had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, as we saw. They didn't exist. The Bush administration decided to invade Iraq for its own reasons. The war in Iraq was in part designed to stop Iran from developing its nuclear program. It was supposed to be an object lesson. It backfired. Iran accelerated its program, made far more progress yeah. in the last six I years than 16. Yeah. It was a huge strategic blunder yeah. on the part of the United States. On, on, on the sobering it, note, it we were going to have to end. Gentlemen, Owen. Thank you for joining Thank Empire. You. Thank you. And I'll be back with a final thoughts. An extensive network of corporations, think tanks, politicians, private contractors, lobbyists, terrorologists, and media pundits specializes in marketing or providing protection, real and imagined, against the backdrop of a culture of politics of fear, against what former Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld dubbed known, unknown, and unknown, unknown threats. This new sociocracy cultivates a culture of unquestioning obedience, where people gradually entrust their rights, privileges, and taxes to their new protectors, public and private. It begins with taking off shoes and belts and going through bag and body searches, and continues with monitoring by countless surveillance cameras, eavesdropping, spying, and eventually leads to spending outrageous sums on sophisticated but useless arms and redundant private contractors. From guards in department stores to mercenaries on the battlefield and from the software engineers to the high-tech industrial technicians, millions of laborers and troops become fully dependent on and at the service of their industrial complex, creating a new class of people with a vested interest in the culture of fear and protection. It is the new sociocracy. Thank you for watching.